Mary, it's such a pleasure to finally nail you down. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see you, Philippa. <laughs> and welcome you to the Conscious Podcast. Um, I was really keen to get you on because you're one of those people that behind the scenes is endlessly working, but also endlessly making change happen. And you and I, now you're going to have to remind me of the year if you know it, first met when we were doing at the BBC's Natural History Unit in Bristol, we were record well, we weren't recording, it was live, a radio program called World on the Move That's about right. animal migrations all over the world, which I loved. Um, um, can you remember when it was? <laughs> um, no. But, the kids uh, were little, I remember that. <laughs> so it's got to have been at least a decade ago, more than at that. At least a decade yeah. ago, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was great fun, wasn't it, with Brett Westwood and the first live natural history radio. So we would go live to elephants in the bush in South Africa and osprey watchers in Scotland and all sorts of stories about these amazing animal migrations. Yeah. And we did it, it for was a year. Really groundbreaking, wasn't it? It was groundbreaking. It was a bit hair raising as well because <laughs> you could never be sure that the connection would would a connect and b stay connected so and live radio that's a bit nail biting but uh, well I love live as you know so less nail biting for me more for everyone else (laughs) I was like we'll be fine absolutely fine it doesn't matter if the elephant doesn't show up it's fine we'll go to something else (laughs) well I'm glad you were fine (laughs) I'm used to it I'm used to the chaos of live but I love it you can see the dog tail in the background there if you're on uh if you're on the oh, visuals, yes, he, yes, he, so did in. he wants to listen to what you've got to say too. So <laughs> Mary, I mean, when when we were together then, you were producing and producing radio, but that wasn't the only thing you produced, was it? No, I worked in television as well. So um, I was uh, a sort of, I think I was the BBC Natural History Unit's first by media producer. That's wow. what they made me. So um, yeah. So, I mean, there's been, it, the, gosh, the world has changed since then, hasn't it? Because everybody does a bit of everything these days or or can do. Um, it's become a lot more fluid and interchangeable. But back then, I think radio and television were incredibly distinct. But uh, I always loved, had a real love for radio. I got into the natural history unit through television, but absolutely uh, loved radio. And I still do. I still, to be honest, it's my first love because... Um, television you're a little bit restricted by what you can talk about in terms of visuals but with radio it the the world just opens up to you with ideas and concepts which might be quite hard to show on telly so I've always loved it Philippa always loved it but I love both that immediacy of just focusing on sound to me and the fact that we didn't have we weren't dependent on a crew with all of the visuals and all of the lighting and all of the things that go with that to get somewhere remote, we, you know, logistically is hard and expensive and often risky. And I just loved the intimacy. So, for example, the elephant story on radio, you could hear him in the background when the guy was talking to us and you could really clearly hear him. If we were looking at him, we wouldn't have concentrated so hard on those stories and it, or, or on those uh, sounds and it wouldn't have been the same. And I think today, though, uh, absolutely back then, um, today you could do both, couldn't you? Because the way of transmitting pictures has absolutely fundamentally been revolutionary. So you could do that intimate audio and just have a little camera running in the background so you could actually see. It won't be all the sort of blue chip marvellous close-ups or anything but you can see both and I think there's this combination of picture and sound is a very powerful way forward because I don't think people mind if it's not top-end gorgeous photography if they've got something really really interesting to listen to and you know we all know it doesn't matter how beautiful the pictures are if the sound's rubbish you can't watch it it's really difficult but you can concentrate on the sound yeah and the story of course, is the most important the thing. Story. With every every aspect of life, it's the stories we tell each other. That's the yeah. important thing. 
Yeah. So what is your story when it comes to conservation? Where did, where, I mean, I completely get the storyteller end of what you do. And it's very similar to what I do. You write, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a bit the same as me. Is it a story? Can we tell it in some form? Great. Yes, probably. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I'm in. Yeah. We can, we can have a go. We can have a go. So where are you asking when my love of conservation started or my passion for it? Um, yeah, it is interesting because I don't think I was very interested in it for a long time. I mean, it's not I wasn't anti it. I just didn't know anything about it. Uh, my background is in physics and geology. It's not in living things at all. So I came to actually I came to natural history through an old boyfriend who uh, was doing a PhD on the scarlet tufted malachite sunbird of Kenya. And the things he told me about wh- what, why they had these flashes of red under their wings. And then from that, all the other stories about why animals behave the way they do, why they look the way they do, all the fascinating intricacies of breeding behavior and uh, and just gen- general life cycle stuff. And I remember it was a little bit like suddenly all these scales falling from your eyes and suddenly a heart being opened or something to, to real wonder. I, I can still recall being transfixed by what he was telling me. And no one had told me those stories before. Biology to me at school was desperately dull. I mean, I could never understand why people did biology. It was ever so you know, describe this, here's that, remember this cycle, you know, nothing that excited me in terms of stories. And then suddenly I had all these characters on the stage. It was like this unfolding drama in front of my eyes. And I was hooked from then on. So that's why I ended up going into the BBC Natural History Unit. But but also um, once that started, the sort of perils behind the scenes, if you like, started to come through as well. And back in the early days, you know, the early 2000s, uh, end of the 90s, uh, we were kind of beginning to be aware things weren't looking that good, but we still had an abundant world on many levels. Um, And so I remember this word climate change coming in occasionally, but, and, you know, we were covering in radio uh, quite a lot of the loss that was going on, the worries that people had. But I wouldn't say it was a level that it is today. Um, And I've always had, so we all need a door. We all need this Alice in Wonderland door to go through, don't we, to sort of reveal another world. And the door for me was the the Eurasian curlew. And everybody says, why do you love curlews? Why was it the bird that got you started? And I I don't know that I can answer that question. It's, It's the hardest question to ask somebody if I asked you what's your favorite animal I can't do it I can't do a favorite I can't because I mean I could say wolves because I've written a book about wolves and because but, but because for me it's a bigger picture it's the stories that come with the wolves of us of what they've been through of what they have to go through to survive you know it's it's all of that so and you can look at any species and find exactly. those stories. But I'm, I mean, the curlew for me is haunting. You know, I remember lying in bed in early, early morning, very far up north in Shetland, in fact, listening to curlews, thinking, wow, it was a moment mm-hmm. that I remember still really, really clearly that haunting kind of, you know, where you are noise. Yeah. yeah. It's what, like so a, what was your first encounter? Was. My first encounter with the curlew was actually on my way to uh, the Sh- to Shetland. Actually, on my way to Shetland, um, uh, I was stopping, waiting for a ferry, and uh, there were some fields. And I noticed in the fields there were then this is in the nineties, loads and loads of curlews. They were gathered after the breeding season and going to the coast. There was loads of them. And I remember thinking, wow, they're so beautiful. They, they're they so beautiful. And the sound was fabulous. It kind of uh, transported you somewhere else. So that was my first. And then I began to notice them more and more. But just as you said with wolves, they are, there's the wolf itself, which is enchanting and an extraordinary creature. But they are a way to look at the world. They are a portal through which we look at ourselves and our treatment of the planet. And that's exactly what curlews are to me. 
I love them for what they are, but more importantly, they tell me about how we're treating the landscapes of Europe, Britain and Europe. So tell us about the curlew. I mean, and I'm sure there'll be people listening going, oh, wait, which one's the curlew again? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so often me going, oh, wait, I know it. Oh, which one? What's oh, yeah, that yeah. one again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the curlew uh, is Britain's largest or Europe's largest wading bird, i.e. they love poddling around in wet meadows and water. Um, they have their distinguishing features, this long downward curving bill, uh, 15, 20, over 20 centimetres long, big, long downward curving thin bill. Looks like the arc of a bow or a new moon, hence their Latin name, Numenius Arquata, Numenius new moon, uh, Arquata shaped like a bow. Um, and, um, and so they're sort of the size of a duck, I suppose, with very long skinny legs, a long neck, a little pinny head, but this gorgeous sculptural bill. And then when it opens its bill, of course, the sound, wow, and it bubbles up in a crescendo of sound and it sort of rises up from the earth itself and just fills a landscape. And I can't ever still, even now, not hear it and it just make me stop in my tracks. In fact, have you noticed when curlews start calling, people actually stop? Because it is something, something to do with the, the pitch, the tone, the, 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 the sort of interweaving of major and minor keys in its call. We don't know whether it's a happy sound or a, a sort of despairing sound or a passionate or whatever. It, it, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary song, which brings to the fore all kinds of thoughts and feelings. So it is a bird which captivates us visually and uh, through its, its song. Um, but more than that, um, it puts us right into the heart of some of the biggest conservation challenges we face in the 21st century. So this poor wading bird that is that nobody dislikes. I've never met one single person who wants to kill curlews. Nobody likes them. Everybody says, oh, the curlew, the sound of the curlew. Um, nobody bears it any ill will. And yet it's collateral damage to so much that we do. And that's mainly because of where it lives, right? Yeah. So mainly where it breathes. So uh, the wintering population, all curlews spend the winter in warm, wet places, uh, lots and lots and lots around the the coast. Some come to very wet lowland meadows. Uh, What they need is access to worms and crustaceans and so on in the soil, in the mud. So they'll go into those places for the winter. But come the breeding season, they go to... Farmers' meadows, lower slopes of mountains, grouse moors, moorland landscapes, in by rough grazing, wildflower meadows, uh, and that's where they breed, and that's where the problems. So the wintering population uh, doesn't really have many threats, but the breeding population has lots of threats. And the so threats tell us, tell us from, about those. Yeah, they come from three main sources. The first one is the transition of the land to much more intensive farming. So uh, particularly in lowland areas, uh, production of silage to feed all the cows and sheep and so on that we have. So silage cutting now begins in April and happens every eight weeks, 10 weeks or so, right the way through, exactly when the birds are nesting. So these huge machines come, cut this very fast growing ryegrass, bond it all up for silage to feed cattle. and take it with their eggs and chicks, as they do. So that's a really major issue in lowland areas. Um, You know, general farm machinery and farm activity with lots of disturbance or heavy livestock, um, livestocking in fields, that's another big issue as well. Uh, But silage cutting is a massive, massive problem. Um, The second big issue uh, everywhere, lowlands and uplands, um, is uh, high levels of predation, sustainable unsustainable levels of predation and we have the highest densities of foxes and crows in Europe in Britain Um, and both of those very very good at finding ground nesting birds and their eggs and chicks not just curlews but ground nesting birds in general but curlews being quite big are quite sort of obvious to them Um, and so some places two-thirds of the eggs go within two to three days of being laid so 
And in some areas, say like in Shropshire, where they monitored nests over three years, uh, about over three years, they monitored 120 curly nests and not one single nest produced a chick. All of them were destroyed, eaten or trashed. So it's, uh, it, it's heart stopping, the statistics of the decline of the curlew. The other big one then is acquisition of land for forestry, for development, for leisure, for all sorts of things. Uh, but we take their peace and their, their, their lovely landscapes away from them for our use. So three big major issues, which, of course, are huge. And climate change is increasingly becoming a worry uh, because very wet springs means they're very delayed in laying, so they don't, they don't get enough time to get going. On the coast, a lot of roosting and sites you know, suffer quite a lot of storms, a lot of flooding of nest sites once they've nested, that kind of thing. That's an increasing pressure as well. So what happens if we lose the curlew? And I know, you know, there are people that would say, well, you know, it's a lovely bird, but what, what of it? You know, I, I, I remember seeing them once. Now, back to my world. <laughs> what are the consequences? Yeah. Which is another reason why I love them so much, because there are no consequences, I don't think. And we could lose the curlew and the world just keeps turning and nobody loses their job. Nobody gets ill. You know, they're not attacking anybody's livestock. So, you know, there's nothing about the curlew <clears throat> which makes them important to us and our economy. Nothing at all. So therefore, they're saying, if you want to protect us, you're, that means that you want to protect nature for all its joy and its wonder. Because not everything has a pound sign next to it or a dollar sign next to it. You know, you don't love your children because they're going to bring work, you know, money into you. Probably the opposite. Yes, <laughs> money right. goes out with that. For sure. <laughs> you don't, uh, you know, your work, the works of art, the beautiful music, the poetry that we read, the, the stuff that makes you feel really human is so worth holding on to. Because if we lose that stuff that has no economic value, simply because at the moment we don't know how to put a price tag on it, what does that say about us as human beings? You, know, you can't put a price on it. As Einstein said, you know, not everything that you can measure has a value. And we, we must value things outside of that. And the curlew to me is one of those iconic species that we say, I would love to save that bird simply because it brings joy to the world. Absolutely. And so what can we do? You know, if, if those nests are being trashed at that rate, is there anything we can do? Yeah, and we know exactly what to do. I mean, the, the point is, we do know what to do. There's, there's not a, it's not rocket science, this. You know, we give them the space and peace to breed and we uh, make sure that they don't get predated at the high levels that we don't mow them over. <clears throat> None of that is difficult to do. The conservation, as you know, Philippa, conservation, animals are easy. Animals know what to do. They just get on and do it. The difficult bit is the people. The difficult bit is getting people to do it, to have the will to put behind doing it. Um, the will and the resources, because those two are very often connected. So we know what to do. We have endless studies, endless reports, endless scientific analysis. We do not need one more report on the curlew. What we want is action. What we want is to put them and all the other creatures that go alongside them to make them more important to us in our society. How do you do that? You do it through education. You do it through awareness raising. You do it through political lobbying. You do it through using arts and music and science and drama and uh, painting and everything. Everything can go towards protecting this planet. And that's and you, what and you most do. of my time does. Yeah. Do exactly that. This is what you do. And how, I mean, it starts with Curly Moon. It starts with a book. It starts with storytelling, which is no surprise at all to me. There's your education, there's your awareness. But you didn't just stop there. You you have continued. Tell me about, you do organise brilliant events, which I can never get to. 
oh, I really want to, oh, I can't go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll get you to one of them. Yes, we will. We will. Absolutely. Tell, tell me, tell us all about some of the things that you do. Because okay, it's so. not, as you said, these things aren't rocket science either. But you have, you do it. And there are so many other people out there who, who will take inspiration and do some similar things, I think. Thank you. Okay, so what I first of all, what I did was uh, straight after my walk. So I walked from the west coast of Ireland through Ireland through Wales, through England, so from Sligo basically to the Wash. That was in 2016. I did this, what I call the Curly Walk, which is 500 miles right across Ireland and the UK. And out of that, I decided, and the reason I walked it was I wanted to go through places where the curlews disappeared, places where it still breeds, places where it's hanging on by the skin of its beak. You know, I wanted to talk to scientists, conservationists, artists, poets, farmers, bird watchers shooters, you name it. I wanted to talk to anybody who would talk to me about what the curly meant to them and what they thought the problem was. That's why I wrote the book Curly Moon out of all that walking. But also what I did was organise four national conferences which brought all these people together in four different countries to say, right, this is this is the situation. They're declining by this much. What are we going to do? So those four and they, these, those four national conferences were really, really important for galvanising a lot of action. At the same time, Prince Charles now, King Charles, who knew, loves curlews, and uh, he organised two meetings of his own, one at Dartmoor and one at Highgrove. They were very sort of similar to the ones I was doing. Um, and he sort of galvanised quite a lot of action on the more sort of establishment level, if you see what I mean. Um, we also organised a meeting in 10 Downing Street. That came about through pure chance. Uh, I happened to be at a BTO meeting and Lord John Randall was there and uh, we started talking and I told him I was interested in Curlew and he said, and he at the time well, it was Theresa May's environmental advisor. Do you remember those days? Mm-hmm. So Theresa May, and she, Theresa May was just about to have to leave and he said, look, let's sneak a meeting in at 10 Downing Street before... Um, Theresa May goes so I think we had one of the last sort of outside meetings in Downing Street and Theresa May's and we brought policy makers national agencies politicians together for that one as well so all this was building up and building up Um, and out of all that came the Curly Recovery Partnership England which is a round table of organizations dedicated to saving the curly from the RSP, BTO, Wildlife Trust sorry not Wildlife Trust uh, WWT Uh, Curlew Action, Bolton Castle Estate, Natural England, Dutchie, all of them sit around the table. I'm the chair and somebody else, uh, Ryan Burrell, is the director. And uh, we meet fortnightly and we do a lot of the political policy, agricultural policy type stuff through that. Um, And what I love about this whole thing is, Mary, it's just you, Mary. You weren't you weren't um, highfalutin in the first place. It wasn't like you were best mates with King Charles or the <laughs> Secretary of State, or you weren't moving in those circles. And so I love when somebody says to me, "Well, what can I do?" Yeah. You know, look at look at what you can do. And I, do you know what it is, Philippa? It's I don't know what it is, but what what I know what worked for me was putting yourself out there. If you just are prepared to be vulnerable if you're prepared to say okay I don't know I can't go to lords and earls and ministers and secretaries of state but I can do a big walk I can write a book I can use whatever training I had at the BBC to tell stories you know I can do that so let me do that and and that's what I did but vulnerability being real about it uh, knowing your limitations but reaching high that's what I try to do and so far it's worked know your so strengths all and those, play on them know your strengths and play on them and don't try and do what you're not that good at and there's plenty of things I can't do I'm absolutely rubbish at detail I rubbish at it um, and so when somebody gives me a policy document to read and literally and you will literally find me under the desk five minutes later <laughs> fast asleep I go I cannot get excited by policy I know I have to know about it but it's much better left to people who have the mind that really drills into detail and finds the importance of it I haven't got it yeah I haven't got it yeah so um 
you know, it's knowing that kind of stuff. But out of all those meetings and the Curlew Recovery Partnership, I all set up my little charity, Curlew Action. And that's what I did as well. My little charity. Little and so <laughs> Curlew Action's doing great. Tell me what, it, what you've achieved. I think what Curlew Action has done is fill a hole left by the major organisations. So we specialise in awareness raising, outreach, education, getting people together, much like I did in those conferences early on after the Curly Walk. We just had last in uh, February, we brought together 108 Curly field workers. These are the people, not the scientists, not the conservationists, not the policymakers. People go out there and put up the electric fences, dig the holes, monitor the birds, talk to the farmers that sort of person. We brought together all of those from right across Europe because remember, this is the Eurasian curlew. You know, it's not our bird. It's not anybody's bird. It, it, it belongs to Europe and it uses the European landscape. It breeds in particular countries, but it spends the winter all over the show. And we host most of the birds that come, that breed in Finland, come to us for the winter. 60% of the birds you'll find in a wet field in Gloucestershire in the winter are from Finland example we get half of the curlews nesting in uh, parts of the netherlands come to us for the winter you can't say this isn't a european bird so let's talk europe wide we're all facing pretty much the same issues so how are you doing the same in the netherlands are you doing the same in poland are you doing the same in finland oh you you approach it differently let's hear from you about what you're doing and that was the idea behind the european workshop and it was i have to say such a positive, life-affirming, successful meeting. It was. It, it brought me to tears with the sort of the way it was so received. Everybody pitched in. Everybody had a great time. But everybody was so passionate about getting this to work. So, yeah, we do that. We do an poetry and art as well. Uh, Will Curly Day, April the twenty-first. April twenty-first in the diary. Because you, you will. So, what are you doing this year for? World well, we always do a poetry and art competition for under 16s and adults. So, get your poetry going, uh, draw us a wonderful picture. But this year, and something that I would expect you to do, Philippa, because, and I shall be looking out for your contribution, is a curly cake. Um, oh, so a curly cake. <laughs> you, Mary, are you doing that deliberately because you know how bad I <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you look like somebody who could smash a curly cake. No, you would want to smash my curly cake. Well, give it a go. So all you creatives out there, whether you can cake, make a cupcake or a make big cake or whether you can paint a picture or write us a poem, send it in and uh, we judge it and you get a pair of socks and a nice badge or something. But more than that, we spread it around. We put it on our website. I use them in my talks, you know, and it gets people to do something that isn't isn't anxious making, isn't making you feel like the world's falling apart. It means like you're actually doing something that's fun. And that's and really that's important as well. Exactly the point of this podcast and exactly why I wanted you on. <laughs> because <laughs> that's the attitude we need. You know, it's really yeah. tough out there. You've gone another step, which... I was so thrilled about when I heard about, and I've heard education come as a theme through what you've been saying, along with storytelling, along with awareness, all of those things tie in for you. But one massive achievement recently is a GCSE in natural history for our, for our children and future generations. How on earth did you make that happen? So the campaign for that started back in 2011. Um, I was increasingly aware, and, and I count myself in this, this category, of being realising that the natural world was obviously in a terrible state and we're losing species at a, an unprecedented rate, including the curlew. But not many people knew about it. And if they did, and, and as you said, I would say to people, oh, we've got to save the curlew, we've got to save the skylark, we've got to save the lapwing, we've got to save the golden plover, etc. People go, you what? What's that? Uh, I don't know what that is. Like you said, I think I do. Hmm, remind me, you know. Or, in the case of young people, no idea at all. And uh, and that really worried me. So I, and I was sitting in a meeting 
And I happened to be sitting next to Tony Juniper, who was then still at Friends of the Earth, I think. And um, and I just said to him, Tony, I think we should have a GCSE in natural history. And it was literally like a light bulb moment. I hadn't actually thought of that before then. But I verbalised it to Tony, who said, right, let's, let's, that's brilliant, let's do it. So he wrote articles and it all got a bit exciting for a bit and then it died away. Um, it was about the time when education was going through major upheavals. Michael Gove introduced a lot of new stuff into education and people said there is no chance you'll get a new GCSE through the system, none at all. And they were right. For years they were right. Um, but I kept going and as soon as Caroline Lucas expressed an interest back in 2018 because I ran a petition I ran one of those government petitions and immediately it got lots of signatures, over 10,000, but then immediately it was pulled because of Theresa May's snap election. So, um, but at least I got 10,000 signatures, which meant I got a response from the government. If you get 10,000 signatures, they have to respond to your petition. And basically they said, we're doing it all already. There's no need for it. It's all in hand. Get back in your box. So that, but that gave me then something to push against. And it got Caroline Lucas interested. She contacted me on Twitter. Um, Michael Gove, we went to see Michael Gove, who actually was very, very helpful. He put us in touch with the exam board OCR and one of their advisors, and it took off from there. And it was announced by the government after a lot of lobbying meetings, endless meetings, writing stuff, all that lobbying stuff, the boring kind of frustrating stuff that you have to do. It was announced in April the 21st, World Curlew Day by coincidence, in the Natural History Museum in London on April the 21st, 2022. But it has taken till now another two years for them to agree the sort of broad brush strokes about what's going to go in it. That took a long time. I don't know why. Well, I do know why, but we won't go into that. Um, so that will... Please. So, uh, But the next step now is that it goes to public consultation that will probably be straight after Easter. So please, please, that means public consultation. It will be on the government website. We'll put it on our website. It will be on the OCR exam board website. It'll be everywhere, I think. Please respond to that public consultation and let us know what you think. So um, that is key. That's with, key. The, with the public response, if the public respond, yes, we want this. We want our children to know about the natural world. We're going to be all right. If it's not, not just yes, we want it. But they've already said yes, they want it. It's yes, I like what's in it. This okay. is what's in it. So it's more about the content now. Okay, good. Yeah. So we moved on a major stage to yeah. this is the content. Have we got it about right? Do you want any little tweaks to it? Or something? It's quite a big thing to do, a public consultation, because I think a lot of people will have a lot of opinions. Um, and then they have to assimilate that Um Ofqual are making sure that it can be examined properly. Um, and when that's done, it goes to all the exam boards to write the syllabuses. And it, they're still saying it should be in schools by 2025. I personally, now, it has taken so long to get the public consultation done, the, the subject matter agreed. I think that's too soon. I think we need to push it to 2026. There's no teacher training in place. There's not really any resources in place. If you were a secondary school, if you ran a secondary school, Philippa, and you were really keen to take it, but say your biology and geography teachers were, were keen, but felt a bit underconfident about natural history, there's not a lot in place to help you. So that's my next thing. That's what I'm doing now. It's gunning for proper teacher training and resources to help schools to teach it. That's where all my effort is going as well. Well, let me know if I can help with that. I'm, I'm, I was so delighted because for years it's bothered me, even down to little things like children not knowing what which birds sound like. You know, is that a blackbird? Is that a thrush? Is that you know, even those little things that used to be a part of everyday life that a couple of generations ago just you know people would be able to say, oh, can you hear the blackbird? Now I think the opposite. I think most people wouldn't be able to know that was a blackbird singing or why. I think if people, people can't name the birds on their bird feeders, they put a bird feeder out. A, a, a survey was done that says 80% of kids between the ages of 8 and 15 uh, don't, can't name a bumblebee. 
can't name um, a nettle, can't name an oak tree, you know. If you don't know these really common, they think they're there, but they don't know what they are. Uh, you know, bumblebee is a big wasp sort of thing. You know, um, all trees are kind of the same. And that matters. People might say, well, it doesn't matter, does it? What it's got? Yes, yes, it does matter. It matters we can put names to it. It matters we know what it is, what it needs, why it's growing there. Are there fewer of them or more of them than there were a few years ago? So what's changed if they're changing? It matters that we understand what lives alongside us because the world is changing, they'll change as well, and they're telling us what's happening to this planet. And we need that conversation with the natural world. We need to understand what they're telling us and we need to understand the impact we have on them. It's essential that we understand the nature around us. And things have gone wrong simply because we don't. We've lost that ability to have that relationship with nature, which is so fundamental. I think the passion is there in children, though. I think they care. And I think you only have to open a book about the natural world and share it with a child for to see that, to see how interested they are. Um, you know, even from a toddler age right up and aware they are. But then if we don't feed that thirst for knowledge and then they then don't understand or name or any of the things that are surrounding them in the natural world, as you're right, you know, it just gets lost and disconnected, that relationship. There is literally no, there's literally an open door with young kids. You know, they, when you, when we, Everybody reads child- stories to children. You don't read them stories about hedge funds and you know the world economy and how much money you can make. You tell them stories about animals. You tell them stories about this fantastically wonderful, surprising, challenging world out there that engages their imagination. And they put all kinds of emotions and feelings onto animals and then animals come back to us with all this, this fabulous sort of creative world that they have. Um, that's you know, that's what we want to take forward. So um, it, it was E.O. Wilson, the great biologist, sadly died recently, who said, you know, he termed it, we have an innate biophilia, innate love of life. But that love of life gets somehow beaten out of us by the time we're teenagers. Now, my, there might be some natural turning away and other things take over. Of course, that's always the case. But we literally flatten it. We, 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 we say, that's for kids, that's for when you were little. Right, let's get on with the serious world now. And it becomes geeky, uncool, and frankly, a waste of time. And people don't see the relevance of it anymore. And it, the University of Derby have done uh, studies on this and shown that you, we lose, most people lose their understanding of the natural world at around about 11 or 12. And they don't gain it again until at least their mid-30s when they start to have kids of their own, if they do then at all. So we've lost that whole time, that formative time when you're young, you're you're hungry for information, you're hungry for what you can give to the world, you're making your way in the world, you're making decisions about the world, and nature has lost, has dropped off the radar. And so maintaining, and that's something we can all do, We even if we don't have children, you know, mine are, mine are grown now but you know you can we all know young children we all can help in that way by exposing children to the natural world and stories about the natural world and the wonders of it it's an, it's another great way we can help I wanted to talk to you also about how you keep going I mean it's it's really tough out there as you say you know you're faced with I mean politics is probably one of the toughest worlds of all how do you keep motivated and not let the cynicism and the depression creep in about the state of everything? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important question. And I wrote an article for British Wildlife recently on that, which got a lot of response. And in the field worker workshop we held recently, we had a whole session on what we called ecological grief or working with loss, because a lot of people fall away. They see if you're working with a species that's in decline, you know, how how demoralizing is that? And when you see a world that appears to be 
uh, as you say, cynical and and uncomprehending, you know, you feel small and helpless. The way I deal with it um, is that I, I have a faith. I was brought up a Catholic and my Christian faith is important to me. Uh, I, it's a very private thing. I don't talk about it much, but it, it's what it does is it gives me a sense of time unfolding. It gives me a sense of this world isn't just about me. It gives me a sense of I'm here to serve and have a duty to do what I have to do and to do it well. And there's a, a prayer and poem that I carry with me at all times. And it's called The Master Builder. And it was written for a, a bishop who was martyred in El Salvador. And it was written for him. And it's utterly beautiful. And it says, I'll paraphrase it, but it says, you know, we are building something magnificent. That's what we're put on earth to do. We, we are on earth to do something wonderful with our lives because we are hugely talented people. Every single soul on this planet has a contribution to make. And what you have to do, <clears throat> your contribution is to put your brick in place. Now imagine we're building a great big cathedral or a temple or something. And all you're asked to do is put that your brick in place. But if you don't put it in properly, if you don't cement it, if you don't measure it, if you don't level it, if you don't make sure that your brick, if you're careless or thoughtless about how you put your brick in place, that building is not going to be what it could be. But all you're asked to do is do that, but you have to do it well. And it's not up to you to know, it's not, it's not your privilege to know whether you'll succeed or not, whether this whole great thing will ever get built. That's not up to you to know. You're not in control of that because you're just a worker. You're one of a huge line of workers going back into the past and stretching into the future. All that's all you are, but you're a very important part of that train of people. But you're not the master builder. You're not, you're not the architect. Um, and I find that, and it says in this poem, there's a tremendous release in realising that. It's not up to you to save the planet. You can't save the planet. I can't save the planet. David Attenborough can't save the planet. But we can all do what we can do. And we all have to do what we can do really well. And with your mind and your heart and your soul, that's what keeps me going. And you, I guess then you have the faith that one day, like when you plant a tree, one day you, you're you not going to see it. It might not ha it happen before your own eyes but it will grow into something magnificent. And the great landscape architects um, of the sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century, they planted avenues of trees. They designed great, magnificent gardens that they would never see. They would never see that realised. But that's not the point. That's not why they did it. They did it because they had a vision they were working towards. And I think having a vision, having a a goal that you walk towards that is that makes you get up in the day and think, I really want to make that vision happen. You know, that's really, really important to me. Live with integrity and live with hope, I think, are the two things. And both of those are attractive and and um, they attract other people and they inspire other people. So you know what it's like, you know, you 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 meet somebody who is a very hopeful, positive active person who's making a difference you just kind of want to be with them you want to you want to feed off that energy and we can all do that it's infectious you know, you don't, yeah it's infectious and you don't have to be barack obama or you know uh luther martin luther king you don't have to be that lofty you can just make a difference in your street within your family within your circle of friends and that it really matters, the small scale and the big scale. They just all matter. So never feel, who am I? What can I do? <laughs> and it was, it was, I don't know, I've heard this saying attributed to so many different people, but, you know, whoever said, you know, small things can't make a difference have never spent a night with a mosquito. So <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah, it is yeah. so true. What a perfect place to end. Mary, thank you so much. I mean, I, we, we could have gone on and on and on, um, but much appreciated. Thank you so thank much you, for your Philippa. time Great and to talk for to you. everything that you do. Um, Likewise. Likewise. Have you got a website? 
yes, uh, curlewaction.org. Go to curlewaction.org, get stuck into World Curlew Day, uh, look out for a new organisation which is starting called Nature Pathway, which will support all the nature education work and um, and just do what you can do and do it very well. That's the message I've got. Lo- love something and love it with all your heart and you'll get somewhere. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Philippa. <laughs>